Jen, spelled A-I-J-E-N. See you there. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2 p.m. Up next, Tara Verde. From the Amazon basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Hi, and welcome to today's edition of Terra Verde, a weekly environment program on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. I'm your host, Jason Mark. Man, did that spring rainstorm earlier this week feel good. The inch of rain we got here in the bay on Monday and Tuesday washed everything clean and it kept the hills green for another week or two. But don't be fooled, that little squall won't come even close to making a dent in California's epic drought. No doubt by now you've heard the news that Governor Brown has ordered mandatory 25% water reductions for all cities across the state. Right now, water districts across California are coming up with their plans for making those cuts, and next week the state water board will be meeting to put them into place. But there's one key segment of the state that, for now, is being left out of those mandatory reductions. California agriculture, which uses 80% of all the water in the state. Why is that? What could be done to reform the way water is allocated for agricultural users? And more to the point, what will it really take to balance our water books so that demand doesn't keep exceeding supply? The drought's a huge story. It's not going away. And this is just the first in a series of programs Terra Verde will be dedicating to the drought in the coming months. Today, we're starting with an overview into state water politics, the view from 30,000 feet, as it were. Here to help me uh, help us navigate the issues are two water policy experts. Connor Everts, a former drought manager for the city of Pasadena, is the executive director of the Southern California Watershed Alliance. Adam Scow, based in Oakland, is the California director for Food and Water Watch. Adam, Connor, welcome to Terra Verde. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Glad you both are here. Connor, let's let's start with you. You've said that we shouldn't even use the word drought, that this is just the new normal in the era of climate change. So when it comes to managing our water today and for the future, how deep is the hole that we're in? Well, we've made the hole even deeper than it needed to be by not having mandatory or reasonable restrictions two or three years ago as we dropped down into historic drought. So at this point, um, some will feel it more than others. Uh, those that have been doing a better job, like Santa Cruz, that are down to 44 gallons per day per person, uh, number two in the state after Cambria, they'll actually only have to save 10 percent. And we're, they're one of the few places that have enforced and required fines, and they actually waive the fine if you go to water school. Tell, tell me, what's water school exactly? So it's the equivalent of traffic school, but they actually teach people how to practically use less water, both in their homes and their businesses. And it's been very effective, and that's part of the reason why Santa Cruz decided not to do an ocean desalination plant and instead went around and got the whole community involved and really is a model. And so they're less impacted by the drought than other communities that haven't even started to do anything. Adam Scow, you wrote recently in an op-ed for the Sacramento Bee that the state has to, quote, realign our water supply. I thought, at least, that the California Water Project was all about guaranteeing a steady supply of water to farms and cities. So what exactly do you mean that we got to realign our water supply? Well, we've overpromised our water in California, um, and it's the start of it is, is that we are using a baseline that is simply unrealistic for how much water nature can provide on a yearly basis. Uh, the state took one of the wettest years in the 20th century and said, this is what we can deliver on, on an annual basis. And they did that probably to get some buy-in uh, from certain ag districts to pay for the state water project. However, it's not reality, and it's less so in an era of climate change and, and a hotter planet. We have more erratic precipitation patterns, less snowmelt. 
so consequently, we've seen a lot of places where there's been a lot of planting that probably there never should have been, uh, specifically down that west side. It's the hottest, driest part of the Central Valley. There's no good local water supply. Uh, and we're seeing diversions away from our San Francisco Bay Delta to irrigate the desert. Uh, much of what is being grown there now is our almonds and pistachios, very water intensive, mostly exported overseas. There's a lot of money being made off it, but it's not uh, reasonable. It's not responsible use of our water. We're going to come. We're going to come back to that. But I, I do want to just make sure I'm perfectly clear. When you say realign our water supply, what you're essentially saying is not that we need to find more water, which might be difficult or close to impossible again in the era of global climate change is that we need to reduce demand we need to re- yeah reduce our demand and smarten our water allocation the state water board needs to balance supply and demand they need to use a realistic baseline of our supply and, and make sure demand conforms to that that is a political process that needs to be done uh led by the governor and his water board it's not going to be easy but this is there's no alternative solution to this this is the hard work that has been kicked down the can, and now that we're in this in this bad drought, it has to be done. It's all be more urgent. Connor Everett, you were already talking about the the hard work that has sort of been kicked down the road. Um, at the same time, we seem to have a, a widespread, in fact, an almost universal public recognition that we're in a severe drought. I think the latest California field poll shows that something like 96% of Californians recognize that the drought is severe. Those other 4% are probably living under a rock someplace. Um, do you, do you think that 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 kind of public recognition is matched up to the I guess we'd say the the, the institutional action? No, no, I don't. And um, yeah, let, let's kick the can down the aqueduct a little bit and talk about um, allocations of water. The Metropolitan Water District is a big wholesaler. Um, more politically than reasonably, is going to set uh, cutbacks that they should have done two years ago of probably about fifteen percent on Tuesday. Um, that won't take place until July. So we've really waited until we've emptied our reservoirs and way after we depleted our groundwater to the point where it's going to be hard to ever bring it back up. Um, so at this point, you know, what I called for was 55 gallons per day per person statewide for equity and to deal with what we have left in storage. But the reality is there are a lot of places on the coast, including the Bay Area, that got a very wet December. Uh, the big reservoirs uh, to the north actually put some storage back in. So if we actually reduce demand to the point where we aren't over pulling what we have, um, we wouldn't be in these situations, and that's really what we have to spe- expect into the future. Um, there's, you know, look at Australia. They had a 12 year millennium drought. They got the per capita down to 30 to 40. They changed their water rights, and the farmers yelled and screamed, but a few years later, it worked out better for everybody. So, um, change is going to come. It's already happened. This isn't something in the future. We're just experiencing what we had been predicting for a long time with the lack of snowpack and that dependency on about 30% of our water supply. But in areas like the Bay Area, if you captured even in that storm you had a few days ago, we got a little downpour while we were having a drought meeting in Southern California, you know, we were meeting the main library in Santa Monica that went into a 200,000 gallon cistern and that will be enough to water over a period of time the appropriate landscape. So we're really matching, having to match those changes. People will save, but agencies don't want to save for, because it's a commodity. Water is something they sell and they have a hard time losing that revenue. But people have to demand more from them. You, you point out that the water agencies here in the state are essentially in the business of of selling water. Has there been any move to try to decouple water rates from the amount of water that's sold, similar to uh, how we have decoupling for electricity here in the state? We have tried to do that so that you would have both what they call decoupling, so conservation programs, and on, on the 20% that goes through the Public Utilities Commission, the private utilities, they've started to do that. But the public utilities that look a lot, a lot like private companies, we have thousands of them up and down the state when you include all the irrigation districts, um, they don't see the need to do that. The other half of doing that is looking at your supply options and ranking them in terms of value and impacts. That's called a loading order in the energy side, and we need to do that on water as well. For instance, then desal would drop to the bottom, conservation efficiency, recycling water would move to the top, and then you would start making those investments based on that. Right now, 
we don't have any sense of priority in water supplies at all, and usually the demand programs drop way down to the bottom. And, Connor, I want to make sure we're clear for our listeners. By desal, you mean desalinization. You mean taking ocean water and making it potable. Yeah, I'm not talking about brackish, which happens inland and needs to be done properly. I'm talking about ocean water desalination. Until we have resolved the amount that we use, you know, we're, we're like an endless leaky bucket. We could just pump all the water we wanted into it as long as we don't make better use of it. And that includes our pipes and our what they call the infrastructure up and down the state. Normal loss is 8 to 10 percent. Um, that's the sort of thing we should be investing in, not in these other technologies that are going to be way too expensive have way too many environmental impacts, including greenhouse gas and marine life impacts. So, Adam, I really want to make sure we get to, and we've, we've still got a lot of time on the show, but get to the 800-pound uh, gorilla that's in the middle of the room, which is agriculture. So, you know, California, as I think most listeners know, is, is really the fruit basket of the nation, producing uh, a preponderance of, of a lot of key uh, fruits and vegetables and nuts and using close to 80% of all the state's water yet they weren't included in this mandatory order from the governor last week. Uh, The first answer is kind of why not? I mean, it seems such an obvious place to tackle since that's the the number one, uh, you know, uh, demand for water. Yeah, well, the agricultural lobby is very political. Now, when we talk about agriculture, um, it's obviously a very important part of California's economy and our identity, and that will continue. Um, However, when it comes to legislation, about water use, uh, proper regulations. Really big ag in particular has, has slowed down progress and good reforms we need to manage our water sustainably. Um, we've never really managed and protected our groundwater in California, even though the governor and the state water board have the constitutional authority to protect all waters for the benefit of all Californians. And this is entirely for political reasons. Finally, last year, a bill was passed, but it, it's too little, too late, very weak, uh, tells local agencies, which are oftentimes part of the problem, to come up with a plan to manage groundwater in five years, and then maybe five years after that, the state may do something about it. So this is not going to get it done. What we need is real leadership from Governor Brown and the Water Board to start managing, start having some sensible limits on, on over-pumping groundwater we saw, in the last three years, uh, a recent NASA study showed that the Central Valley alone has lost 8 million acre-feet of water uh, in just three years. That is more water uh, uh, than is needed to supply Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego combined for 10 years. So uh, we need to start having some sensible, rational limits with groundwater. We're going to come back to that groundwater conversation. But, I mean, Adam, you say that the, the agriculture industry is is powerful, and I think that's, that's pretty self-evident to a, a lot of listeners. At the same time, as a share of the state's overall economy, if you're just going to sort of crudely measure it by, by GDP, and also even even as sort of a, a share of the overall population and workforce, it's pretty small. I mean, most folks are living in cities along the coast. Yeah, that, that's, that's definitely true. Um, and there's ways in which our agricultural economy has, has spread some inequities. Um, it's not because uh, we grow food. It's because of the way we're doing it and who's controlling the system. Uh, this is uh, well described in a book that our executive director, Winona Howder, wrote called Foodopoly. But we saw the consolidation of big farms in the Central Valley. Acreage limits have been lifted. So what was initially intended... Uh, the state water project and the Central Valley project, the federal project, was initially intended to help small family farmers settle the valley. That system has been grossly abused over time. And what we've seen, actually, is consolidation of farms, consolidation of money, and higher unemployment uh, as that process continued. So some of the highest unemployment rates, some of the highest hunger rates, ironically, are right in the Central Valley, the most productive agricultural region in the world. Uh, so we're actually going to need this angle needs to be approached at state and federally dealing with busting up monopolies in the food system. That is obviously its own problem. However, Governor Brown and the Water Board need to come at it from the water angle and ensure that our water is being managed sustainably. And of course, as you were mentioning earlier, that all of these almonds and pistachios that we're growing are largely uh, exported overseas. Essentially, we're shipping our water across the Pacific Ocean, but at the same time, we're shipping our water across, you know, North America as we're as we're growing food for people across the continent. 
Yeah, that's right. And what we're saying, obviously, it's a difficult conversation to to say. Well, this is, we should only go this much of that, this much of that. It, that's very tricky. Uh, but the first place to start, and this is what I mean by talking about alignment, is that whatever we grow, our agriculture has to conform to the realities of our water supply, and it is way out of balance right now. That's true of the state water project. It's also true of the Colorado River, uh, which does not reach uh, the delta in Mexico anymore, and we see massive alfalfa growing uh, um, on the uh, California-Arizona border. Most of that is for export as well. So we really need to revisit uh, these agreements, get them into reality. This is Jason Mark, and you're tuned to Terra Verde, a weekly environment radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Today we're talking about the California drought and water politics with Adam Scow. He's the California Director of Food and Water Watch. And Connor Everts, he's the Executive Director of the Southern California Watershed Alliance and also the facilitator of the Environmental Water Caucus, a statewide organization. This is just one of the first of many drought shows we're going to be doing over the coming months. And we'd love to hear from you, listeners, about what are some of the other issues regarding the drought that you'd like to hear about. So if you've got an idea for a show, please email us at terraverdekpfa at gmail.com. Pretty straightforward. It's just terraverdekpfa at gmail.com. Connor Everts, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how to sort of rebalance, um, you know, the the all of the water that the agriculture industry is using. I mean, what do you think some of the things that could happen to uh, um, to, to get agriculture serious about their, their water use and, and getting some reductions? Sure, Jason. First, we don't measure or monitor our groundwater. And despite politicians um, congratulating themselves last year on a groundwater bill, the first one uh, in California, but the last in the nation to do it, um, that doesn't really um, – get implemented until 2040. So I'll be lucky if I'm still alive to see the results of that. Um, so we have to, one, acknowledge that our groundwater is overdrafted. We have to meter and monitor what we have. And uh, while we may not tell people what to grow, if it's the only cost is uh, pumping that water and not limiting it, it really encourages rice, cotton, alfalfa. We've talked about nut crops, berries, and others, often in the worst soils where they need more irrigation. So if you actually grow almonds in the North Sac Valley and you have fertile soils, and ample groundwater, even though it needs to be managed as well, um, you're using about a third as much water. So there are places, there are organic farms, there are people that have reacted to um, some fallowing and have learned to grow crops that can either be fallow, you know, annual high-value crops, or um, they have adjusted to the amount of water that they may get. Um, so it's, a, as Adam said, a difficult discussion, but we have to be honest about it. There are going to be winners and losers, and there are going to be people because of water rights who are actually selling that water that they have a priority right to to others. There's others that have junior rights have been misusing the water for years and um, don't have an expectation that they uh, are entitled to that water because of the federal contracts. So all of that's going to have to change. And that's a, you know, Mark Twain's famous for his whiskey and drinking quote about water, but the real one is um, he, he likes progress, but he has a hard time with change. And the change has already happened to the salmon fishermen, uh, the commercial fishermen and the communities off the coast that depended on them because we have lost them to the level of extinction. And that's happening at the same time. So without having any sense of priorities, we've really pitted one against the other. We've pitted urban against ag. And um, that's not working, but people are – awareness is growing every day. I think um, in the last few weeks, both Adam and I have probably got more media calls than we ever have, and it's a wonderful opportunity. But we may have to make the most of it to make real change and not just think of this as a drought that will end but a situation we've been in and put ourselves in for many, many years. So, Adam Scow, in, in your op-ed in the Sacramento Bee, you, you suggested that perhaps we might have to retire some farmlands, especially in the Westlands Water District on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley, where it's more arid. And again, as you and Connor are both talking about, elevated levels of selenium make it difficult to grow anything in, in the first place. I mean, California farmers would say, well, geez, last year we, we fallowed 400,000 acres across the state. Um, this year we're looking at anywhere from 700,000 to a million acres are going to be fallowed to these water cutbacks. They're going to say, we've already taken a huge hit. How can you expect us to fallow uh, even more land and, and, and basically put us out of business? Well, I, I don't see the iron. Actually, I, I see that as, as uh, part of this realignment. Part of the reason why so many farms in that hot, dry part of the valley 
are going are fouling is because there's just no water to support it. Um, and this comes to the, the need to rebalance uh, water light rights with supply and demand. Now, as we go through that process, it will become clear that we've overplanted and some land should be retired. The obvious place to start is that hot, dry west side. It was controversial to ever put that land into production to begin with. It, it was considered one of the biggest mistakes in the history of California agriculture, as, as Mark Reisner described in his book, Cadillac Desert, famous book about uh, water in the West. And so I think it's time to right the wrong. It's time to correct the mistake. Um, retiring uh, the land may, uh, I think it's only fair that, uh, some farmers receive compensation, farm workers as well, who have relied on that economy. Certainly people uh, deserve some assistance. But uh, this is uh, part of the difficult process of correcting the egregious mistakes and over-promising water when, that we never had. So, but this will be the solution, and, and people should be compensated fairly. And where would that money come from? That would come out of the general fund or something? Well, absolutely. Yeah, the money could come out of the state and the federal government. We already subsidize that water to begin with. We're already subsidizing uh, millionaires and billionaires getting rich, exporting almonds to, to China. Uh, this practice would subsidize stopping that practice, putting our water to better use, saving it for future generations, and ensuring the San Francisco Bay Delta can be a healthy environment for, for the salmon as well. So. Uh, we have Proposition 1 just passed last year. That was $7.5 billion. We could get some money from there. We should get some money from the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, this is a much cheaper alternative than the governor's proposal to build a $67 billion tunnel project to divert the Sacramento River away from the Bay Delta. That is the worst possible uh, solution. It's not a solution. It would continue the over-irrigation of that, of that toxic land. Uh, to, to satisfy that greed, because some of those uh, big farms down there, like Stuart Resnick, who's a Beverly Hills billionaire, owner of Paramount Farms, the largest grower shipper of almonds and pistachios in the world, they know that that land has a lot of selenium and won't be farmable forever. The smarter ones, the more greedy ones, are in it for the water business. Water is the most valuable crop at the end of the day. They will resell and engage in water marketing off of our taxpayer subsidies. That's wrong. Let's put an end to it. Connor Evers, you agree with that? It's the worst possible solution to dig a tunnel, uh, moving moving parts of the San Joaquin, you know, into the into the valley. Uh, ab absolutely, it wouldn't get us any water in Southern California, and the irony is it wouldn't even be used in the midst of a drought. So it wouldn't give them the reliability. And I think that um, plan. Um, despite the amount of money they've invested in the time, it's been a distraction during the drought. I think that's about to blow up, and we should get down to matching our land uses to our water resources. Um, and people seem to forget that there's almost 2 million people in this state before the drought without access to clean, safe, and affordable water. So there's communities not only along the 99 with high nitrates and can't drink their water and are expected sometimes by water agencies they're paying money to to go out and buy bottled water for all their domestic use, but also in areas in southeast Los Angeles. At the same time, we have new developments going in, and we have new almond trees being planted along the five. Why are we doing any of those things in the midst of the drought when we haven't even complied with the need for those that are the most needy to get free, safe drinking water and um, wastewater facilities as well. So at the very basic level, we should be able to provide water for people, I think, at, for free. And then when you step it up to the next hi higher and higher uses, they should be paying much more. And then that should fund back into the conservation program so the whole system becomes more efficient. Connor, Adam Scout earlier mentioned Proposition 1. That was the water bond that mm -hmm. the legislature put on the ballot last year. It passed. It had been very controversial for a number of years. It had been sort of on the ballot and then off the ballot. I think a lot of folks felt that it was put on the ballot last year because already in the year three of the drought, you know, there was urgency and it was going to pass. Did that in any way kind of prepare us for our current situation? No. Uh, there's $250 million in the $7.545 billion bond for water conservation statewide for urban and Ag. So it, it, people voted for it, thinking it was to do with the drought. One might wonder if the water agencies didn't extend the drought just to get that passed. And then another $1.1 billion was pushed through the legislature recently, most of it a holdover from 2006 for flood control. 
Um, when, when we're not even talking about flood control as a method anymore, we now want to capture any water when it does rain and reuse it. Um, and then that only had a small portion, again, for the communities that really needed it as well. I think $278 million out of that total. So we're really misappropriating funds. We're not reacting to the drought. Um, water agencies are going to see people react and use less water. People want to save water, and they will do it with uh, incentives and some direction, and I think that's where we're going to be going. Um, and the water agencies are going to be a world in hurt because their business model of, of that there's an endless supply out there has been blown up uh, with the reality, and the drought just allowed us to see a window into the future. That was uh, Connor Everts. He's the executive director of the Southern California Watershed Alliance. We're talking uh, sort of the 30,000 view, uh, 30,000 foot view from above, talking about the drought today. But this is going to be a continuing topic of conversation here on Terra Verde in the weeks and months to come. If you have an idea for a drought-related show, something you think it really needs more attention, please send us a tip at Terra Verde KPFA at Gmail dot com. Um, Adam and Connor, this is for both of you, but Adam, I'd love to hear your thoughts. First, I mean, is it enough? I mean, you know, a lot of folks say, well, you know, let's raise the rates. Let's, let's make sure the rates for water, especially in places like the Imperial Valley, are raised to reflect uh, uh, the market realities, and then just the market will decide. Do you think that's sufficient? I mean, if we just had made the, the farmers pay more, would it sort of lead to the shakeout that you're talking about? Uh, no, I think that's uh, just kind of a knee-jerk uh, reaction that, that is, uh, doesn't, it's not really well thought through. I mean, and, and as Connor mentioned, and, and as I was mentioning, we're seeing certain farm interests engaging, happy to engage in reselling water to cities and uh, uh, other um, ag districts for profit. Um, the only real way to get a handle on our water supply is to really do it in, in a democratic and straightforward way about enforcement uh, and management of what's actually there. And that's not easy. There's no shortcut. Uh, we can't wave the, the magic wand of the market, which is, is never that clean anyways. Uh, we need hard limits, uh, and uh, certain economic interests will not accept that, but that's too bad. Uh, our job, uh, in all, and we're going to need all Californians to get more involved, is to put a, a lot more pressure on Governor Brown and through our state elected officials to get our water supply house in order it's going to be a fight connor and i have a lot of great ideas solutions a lot of californians do none of them will be implemented without a fight big ag big oil continue to to have most of the water rights they have the game they have a lot of the politicians so we really need californians to uh, join with us to uh, make these changes happen so we can continue to have a flourishing economy uh, a healthy ag system and a healthy environment. Well, Connor, you're going to get the last 30 seconds here, the last word about some of your great ideas, as Adam was saying, for for addressing this in the long term. You know, I, I think that uh, realize that water in California, especially, is a finite resource, and treat it with the value it deserves, and uh, recognize those in the most need um, deserve. Um, fresh and clean water. And a little shout out to the organic farmers and the smaller farmers out there because uh, they need to be maintained as well. Um, so uh, everyone has to get behind this change and realize um, we've we've lived off um, a fantasy and that fantasy has come to an end with this drought and we should expect to get better um, with, with less and more efficient. And we, we will do that. And there are solutions out there and there's great examples. Well, um, uh, not only Connor, that's all Australia, the time. but Connor, also, Connor, that's uh, all the time we've got to, for today's show. Um, thank you so much for that fantastic conversation. Thanks to our engineer, Erica Bridgman. This show and others are available, at, for, as always, at kpfa.org for your convenience. Have a great weekend. Thirteen ways of looking at the death penalty, says Archbishop Desmond Tutu, is a deeply moving account of why an abominable practice, the death penalty, should be abolished. He's describing the new book by Italian journalist and legislator Mario Marazziti, who will soon be here from Rome. On Wednesday evening, April 15th at 7.30, he'll speak at the Hillside Club, 2286 Cedar Street in Berkeley. There is wheelchair access at this KPFA benefit. It will be hosted by Matt Cherry, Executive Director of Death Penalty Focus. Other sponsors include Northern California ACLU and Amnesty International SF. Tickets 
are at brownpapertickets.com and supportive bookstores. Find more info on the KPFA website for April 15th. Mario Maritzetti, coming from Rome. You could certainly make it from the Bay.